something you you accept in order to to uh, to open yourself for higher consciousness. So in the seventeenth chapter, Krishna talks about this, the austerities of the mind. He says satisfaction, simplicity, gravity, self-control, and purifications of one uh, one's existence are the austerities of the mind. So we've been talking about the mind last night and this morning about what is the nature of the mind, how to control the mind, where, and how to direct the mind in the right direction. So in order to do that, the intelligence has to be strong. <laughs> the intelligence is weak, then the mind can never be controlled. So how do you make the intelligence strong? By hearing from the Shastras and by, and by performing some uh, uh, austerities, in other words, giving up certain things that are keep you on the bodily platform. Uh, the recommended austerities is, of course, the four regulative principles to follow those strictly, then chant 16 rounds every day without fail on beads. These are the basic austerities, and from then, other austerities come, like, you know, uh, fasting on certain days of the month, uh, and uh, performing activities which uh, force the mind to uh, think about Krishna, such as uh, going to the temple functions like that, reading the books, and, and uh, watching your mind. We talked about watching the mind, how the mind has to be watched, just like you watch a little child who you never know what it's going to do next. This is the nature of the mind. The mind can get you in trouble. <clears throat> all of a sudden, you're you're here in Ljubljana and you're in the class listening. All of a sudden, you're in downtown Ljubljana shopping, <laughs> or <laughs> watching some TV program in your mind, <laughs> or something. That's the nature. The mind is always moving. It's called. It's it's liquid. It's it's kind of like. Just goes. It doesn't stay in one place. Constantly moving, moving. To keep the mind focused means it connected to a, to transcendental sound vibration, and absorb oneself in that sound vibration more and more, and then the mind becomes fixed. But then again, as uh, it's mentioned in the Padma Purana, there's four ways that one can, uh, one four three things that one has to practice in order to control the mind. And that is, um, one has to have faith in the sound vibration that is coming. In other words, you would choose to hear from people who are authorized from Srila Prabhupada, from Krishna, from their scriptures. So by choosing that, you automatically have faith that what is being said is the, is the absolute truth. And then, that faith takes you to the second point, which is humility. Having a open... Uh, consciousness where one doesn't try to challenge what is being heard but accepts in a very direct way. In other words, assimilates the sound vibration and tries to understand it rather than try to challenge it or block it. So that is called humility. First is accepting the authority, second is humility. Now the third one is the one where we struggle all the time and that is, it's called def uh, destroying the faults of the mind. So the mind will wander, just like now I'm talking and some of you are somewhere else. But that's, that's the wandering mind. So bringing it back to what the, the sound, either the, the page you're reading or the words you're hearing, bringing it back, bringing it back, bringing it back, bringing it back, until finally the mind uh, starts to uh, surrender. So it might sound a little severe, but you, we have to watch and see where your mind is going. That way you can bring it back. Because it'll escape automatically, and all of a sudden you're wondering. Right? Just like you're chanting Hare Krishna, and then all of a sudden you're, you know, you're somewhere else. You're in a movie, or you're talking to somebody. It's, it's just like the nature of it'll, it'll, it'll do it two ways. First, the mind will not obey your command. It'll just go wherever it wants to go. So you start forcing it. 
So you finally you start forcing it and bringing it back and then you're working on it. Finally you seem to get it. And then when you're getting it, all of a sudden, it doesn't run away anymore. It just kind of sneaks away. <laughs> and where did it go? I was there. <laughs> Whoa. Okay, you're over there. Come back. And so you bring it back again and he says, all right, I'm coming. I'm coming. Don't worry. I'll be there. And so it comes and then again, all of a sudden, wow, what are you doing over there? You know, I like variety. <laughs> so this is the nature of the mind. It just keeps moving one way or the other. So to to really control the mind means to really... And Prabhupada gives a, a certain statement which mean kind of gives the qualification for mind control. And he says that one has to hear with rapt attention. The word rapt, R-A-P-T, means complete absorption in the sound. But then he says, no one can have rapt attention who is not pure in mind. So then what do you do if you're not pure in mind? He says, but you have to have rapt attention, and only those who are pure in mind can have rapt attention. And then he says, when, if you're not, if you don't, if, and they ought to be pure in mind, you have to be pure in activities. That means you have to perform activities in devotional service and not material activities. And then he goes on to say, and pure in activities means pure in eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. So regulating those activities according to uh, religious principles makes one qualified to develop pure activities which shall lead to pure mind, which, to, which will allow you to have rapt attention. And you might think, well, what do I do in the meantime? <laughs> And Prabhupada gives a concession, all right. But anyway, just try to hear, he says. <laughs> Even if you're not on that stage of pure mind, just, just somehow or other try to hear and listen and as much as you can and practice that process. It's called, there's different types of weights of the listen. And there is challenging listening, there's empathetic listening, there's wanting to learn listening, there is listening to want to... Uh, take what you hear and use it for yourself. <laughs> like, I remember I was sitting in one class with one very senior devotee speaking, and I was thinking, okay, I'm going to learn some points in this class, and I'll use it in my class. <laughs> so I sat down, and the first thing he said, now, don't come to class to get some ideas for your own lecture. <laughs> first thing he said when he opened the... And I thought, oh, that's, that's the end of that. <laughs> I was exposed. <laughs> And I was sitting in the back, so he didn't even see me. <laughs> so Krishna's in the heart, and he knows. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's not in a way to listen, to, to pick up some information that you can use it for your own uh, advantages. It's, um, and so destroying the false of the mind means catch that wandering mind and bring it back to what is being said. And then the results of doing these three, that is faith in the, in the hearing, Humility and destroying the faults of the mind leads to the fourth. And then you know, if you're doing the first three based on the fourth, the fourth is a conclusion. Two things happen, by the way, the hearing process. One is that you get realizations. Oh, yes, this makes sense. I understand it. I, it's under and the second one is questions. So if you're not getting realizations on what you're hearing or no questions are coming up, that means you're not really in tune with the sound vibration. Because even if you don't know or don't understand naturally, there will be questions. But if you're hearing and, you are, and you're accepting and understanding and you're getting realizations, then that is also what we say, proper hearing like that. So that's from Padma Purana. It gives us the, the blueprint on how to practice the process of hearing in such a way that it becomes effective. Like that. Because it's all based on hearing. And then gradually the mind becomes what we say focused. And, so, and therefore, when hear the austerities of the mind, another one is to become satisfied. The mind is never satisfied. There's always something wrong, right? <laughs> This is not right, he's not right, she's not right, I'm not right, you're not right, Krishna's not right, it's not right. It's not right. <laughs> Something is always wrong in life, right? 
But that's that's dissatisfaction. Everything is the way it is. It's perfect. Om Purnam Bhada Purnam Idam Purnad Purnam Budachate Purnasya Purnadeya Purnam Eva Vavhishyate Everything is perfect and complete because it's coming from Krishna and everything is working according to Krishna's arrangement. So everything is actually in the stage of perfection. It's you that it's out of perfection. <laughs> So, therefore, putting yourself in perfection means to accept everything ultimately as the arrangement of the Supreme Lord and work with that arrangement to simply make advancement based on that. So a devotee is satisfied. Sometimes a devotee thinks, I want to be like that. I want to be like that person. I want to be like this person. Or oh, that person is better than this person, right? Or he's better than her and she's better than him and they're both better than me and I'm better than all of them. <laughs> so the, compa the comparing mood, right? Compare when comparing, 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 comparing. That's not satisfaction. So satisfaction means to accept the fact that whatever you are is Krishna's arrangement. And that's wonderful. That's the point. It's wonderful because Krishna may, has made everyone perfect. And even in, within our material situation, we are at a certain standard, a certain evolution of our activities where we can accept whatever we are and work with that to increase, uh, to make it better. So becoming satisfied, one devotee would say, just be yourself because every other position is already taken. <laughs> you got it? <laughs> That means you can have be you can only be yourself. So be satisfied with yourself, and because you're perfect, your pure soul, and Krishna loves you. <laughs> That's the point. Krishna loves everyone perfectly and completely. There was one devotee. She was leaving her body, and she, she kept saying at the end, "Krishna loves me." That's all I know. <laughs> As she was leaving her body from some disease, she was. Happy that she knew in her heart, she realized Krishna loves me, and therefore, because he loves me, everything is perfect, even though I'm leaving the world. <laughs> now that, that's Krishna consciousness. <laughs> so this satisfaction is a very wonderful state of existence because it destroys this anxiety and this desire to somehow or other uh, have something or be something that is just outside. We want to be Krishna conscious, that's the whole thing. <laughs> Other than that, we're satisfied with whatever we have by Krishna's arrangement. <laughs> Sometimes people look at other people's material situation and they think, oh, that's a better situation if I just had that. But that person who you're looking at is thinking, my situation is not so good, I want something different. <laughs> Everyone's thinking the same thing. Right, everybody's looking at someone else, you know, the grass is greener on the other side. He used to say that as a cliche. So everyone, be satisfied, and therefore from there you can practice Krishna consciousness. And then you can be happy within yourself. Sometimes people don't like themselves for whatever reason. But that's, they call it self-envy, or envious of oneself. But that, why is that? Because... I want to enjoy, but my nature is not to enjoy. Therefore, I don't like me. <laughs> I want to enjoy, and my nature is to serve. I enjoy by service, not by trying to enjoy. So when I, when I, if I really want to enjoy, then let me act according to my nature, which is servant. Then I will enjoy as a servant. I can't enjoy any, any other way. I can't enjoy as an independent enjoyer. That's material life. Everyone wants to enjoy by their own arrangements, ideas, mental procedures, like that. But a devotee knows enjoyment means to serve, because that's my nature. I don't like myself because I'm a servant and I want to enjoy, not by serving, but by other ways. Therefore, I'm not happy with myself. So be, be satisfied that you're a servant, and the best thing you can do, and the only thing you can do, is to serve serve Krishna and serve Krishna's devotees, through that you become happy and find satisfaction in that. Because that's your nature. So this satisfaction is, is, is one of the most important principles 
of uh, keeping the mind in a very peaceful state. <laughs> it says there's three things. This is kind of not like direct shastras, kind of like f from the shastras, but more like just additions to the shastras. It says three things you should always be satisfied and three things you should never be satisfied with. Which one do you want to hear first? Huh? Both. And we have a what order? <laughs> What's first? Huh? What not? What three things we should never be satisfied with? One is chanting the holy names of the Lord. We can never get enough of that. Two, hearing the glories of the Lord. We can never get enough of that. And giving in charity. So and then, therefore, give always one devotee always wants to give in charity in some way or another. And there's no limit to that. There's no satisfaction. And none of, we reach a point where it's enough. That where these three things. So we can't get enough of the holy name. We can't get enough of hearing about Krishna. We can't get enough of the opportunities to give in charity. And these are the three things you should never be satisfied. And the three things you should always be satisfied with is money that comes of its own accord. In other words, not being anx anxious to, to have more material things. When you're anxious, you're struggling, you're in anxiety, you're never happy. By Krishna's arrangement, do some occupation to bring in some, some, some you know, finances and whatever the arrangement is there, live simply and be happy with that. In other words, don't make big plans to make a lot of money and struggle so hard and then having to work so hard simply to waste time when you could be doing other things that would be more beneficial for your spiritual and for your material development. And the other one is um, always be happy for whatever prasadam comes. <laughs> the dal is burnt today. Good, it's got a little extra flavor. <laughs> In other words, yeah, so one should be satisfied with, with food, whatever it comes. For those of you who don't cook, especially me, I know that. I have to really practice that one. <laughs> when food that comes is, all right, this is Krishna's arrangement. The cook can't cook, but still, <laughs> this is what happens. So being satisfied whatever food comes by way of natural arrangement. And the last one is wife. Be happy whatever wife you have. <laughs> but then again, the, the Shastras also turn it around and we can use a little... <laughs> I mean, wife is life. She, sometimes she gives strife. And she'll pull a knife. <laughs> But that's a wife, <laughs> and that's life. <laughs> what can you do? So don't be... I can't think of another thing to rhyme with. <laughs> so, but no, be happy with your spouse, whether it's husband or wife, be sad. And work with that. The, the divorce rate in the world now is, is over 50%. It used to be over 70% at one time. Now, the rate has dropped over the years. Why? Because people don't get married anymore. <laughs> they just somehow or other come together and, and you know, it's just like... <laughs> so, yeah, it's no more the sanctity of married life which allows one to practice Krishna consciousness in the best possible way. Krihasta ashram is the best ashram. Why? Because it allows a foundation where two people who are working together can do twice as much to for each other as one person struggling alone. And that's why in the third canto there's a lot of glory about the Grihasta Ashram like that. Wife the wife is the better half of the husband. That's mentioned so many times before. That isn't that is a truism, that's not just a cliche. Someone asked, Well what about brahmacharis and sannyasis? <laughs> and of course, the answer is Radharani is there for them. <laughs> so she's this, the female energy that gives support to these celibate ashrams. But 
for the devotee who lives in the Grihastha ashram. Actually, it says a wife is a boat that can take one across the ocean of material existence. So if the wife is, is supportive in all the activities of Krishna consciousness, Prabhupada said the house is Vaikuntha, then the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi, automatically lives in that home. So sometimes we think one ashram is better than another, but no, the ashram is the place where you perform your activities in Krishna conscious. So wherever ashram you are in, stay in that and work with it and develop it and like that. And if there's some reason to change based on increase in Krishna consciousness, that has to be evaluated and then you can move accordingly with guidance from superiors and not by based on one's own ideas because we're own, we don't see the whole picture. We never see the whole picture. So yeah, to be satisfied with one's spouse is very rare nowadays, you know. It's very rare nowadays. But the thing is, you have to take the, the, the relationship above the problems that, in, that may manifest. You have to come to the spiritual platform. You can't solve the problems on the, pro, on the level the problem is made. You have to go to a higher level and use religious and spiritual principles in order to help one to overcome. And... And when, when there is struggles between husband and wife in relationship, if they work together to overcome these struggles, the relationship becomes stronger. As opposed to just going away, and then again, and then that causes so many difficulties for each of the individuals. And nobody knows what my next situation is going to be better. There's a lot of hope that will be better, but a lot of times it's not. So it says those who, who, who undergo divorce usually go to divorce two or three times in life. So, but the idea is to become Krishna conscious. That's the answer. <laughs> Just become Krishna conscious and then you can deal with any situation in whatever ashram you're in. Like that. You want to know the secret of not getting divorced? You know, I get all these problems all the time, you know, because people come to me, so I'm kind of like, I'm theoretically good at it, but not from the realized platform, <laughs> because I haven't practiced. You know how to keep a, a marriage together when it starts falling apart? Any of the ladies want to guess? Say one person wants to go and the other person wants to stay. What does the person who want to keep the relationship should do to make it again work? Looking for qualities. Huh? Looking for qualities, not sure. Faults. Yeah, that's one way. Yeah. Trying to develop qualities. Huh? Trying to develop qualities. Trying to develop loving qualities. Mm -hmm. But the other person may have a... a Kind of a, like a door up. You have to break down that door. <laughs> Any many of the men want to guess? Romance. Remind the partner how it was when you first met. <laughs> that really renews the relationship a lot. Because, you know, what brought it together was wonderful. Now it's something different. Bring back that, those memories and bring it in such a way that a person can actually experience it. Because that's there in their experience. All you just have to do is bring it out again. Works. <laughs> anyway, I don't know how I got on marriage counseling, but so... <laughs> There's a nice book. There's a devotee who's coming this weekend. His name is Subha Vilas. He has a book that he's written. It's called Perfect Love. And it's five and a half stories from the scriptures. And he'll probably, he might even, you can ask him about it. And I've read it, and it's the most amazing book to help people who are in Grihastha Ashram. It's all about the perfect romances that happened in the scriptures. 
and the struggles that they all went through in order to bring it back perfection at the end. It's really an interesting book. I was thinking, what does a sannyasi do reading this book? But when I started to read it, I was really, it's the, the information and the insight and the stories that he brings out to bring these points out is really the highest forms of understanding relationships and how to work through difficulties like that. Life is difficult. There's no question about that. When you accept that, then you can make progress in life. If you're looking, if you're thinking somewhere in life it's going to be easy, then you, you're living, in, some, in, living in, a, in an illusion. You're living in an illusion. And whether you're practicing relationships in, in, in married life or friendship or day-to-day -day life with people in general or you're practicing your Krishna consciousness, there's always difficulties. There's always challenges. Accept them as opportunities for growth rather than opportunities to go away or try to make things easy. Because when we accept them as opportunities for growth, then the Krishna works in such a way as to help us by directing our intelligence and also giving us the understanding how to move forward in these situations. But when we, when we back off, but then there has to be a goal. What is the goal of working towards this relationship in order to make it better? And that goal is ultimately to become Krishna conscious, of course, or to become happy in the relationships. Mm -hmm. So never become discouraged by difficulties, because difficulties are actually uh, opportunities for spiritual and also material development. It says there's one person. I'll give you an example of a, a situation in life. Her name was Wilma Rudolph. Have you heard of her? Wilma Rudolph. She, um, she goes back to the 1930s. She was born in Germany, um, and then moved, I think she started to move in, and she, living, she was living in America for a while. She was born, and she had legs that couldn't walk. The doctor said she would never walk in her life. So as a baby, she couldn't move. And as she started to grow up, she started to realize her deficiencies. And then she said to her mother, I want to walk. And her mother was very positive. She, she said that if you go to God, God can do anything. So pray to God. So she kept praying, 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 praying as a little child. And as she was growing up, she started to practice the walk along with praying. And gradually, as she grew up, she started to walk. And then she actually became almost, she actually became normal. Then she went to school and she was still praying. She said, Mother, I don't know, only want to walk, I want to run. <laughs> so then she started entering into running competitions in her classes in school, and she started to come out one of the best in the class. She went on to win the Olympics in America for running. <laughs> because she had this determined, I want to run, I want to run, and God's going to help me. <laughs> he did. She had such determination. So you look at that, and there's one Christian preacher. I don't know if you've seen him. He's on the internet. He has no legs and no arms. You've seen him? Yeah, he's an amazing person. He's a, he's a full-blooded full Christian. He preaches really, really strong Christianity. But his attitude is completely positive. He has no legs and no arms, but he goes swimming. <laughs> And he does a lot of things. He's not limited by the fact that he has no limbs. He understands by with the power of God, I can overcome my deficiencies and become a, become a, a, you know, a, a good person in the world, a happy person. So we're never put into such difficulties. But sometimes these difficulties, when they do come, they give us a chance to see what we can do in order to... Uh, 
So then my point is never be discouraged by reverses in life. Reverses in life are always opportunities. As long as we keep good association and we also pray to Krishna. Because without that prayer to Krishna, we don't have any real direction in how to respond to these, uh, these difficulties, which direction to go in. Krishna works with his devotees to help them understand. And Krishna consciousness is a struggle. The only way you don't struggle is when you become a pure devotee. <laughs> when you reach pure devotional service, then everything is naturally happy and joyful all the time. But to reach that stage, we have to go through these difficulties in life. And we have, they're called the nartas, or things that block our spiritual path. But therefore, take inventory and see which things you don't need in life and get rid of them. The excess baggage, the things that envy, criticism, nonsense talk, wasting time, uh, these are the things that really take away from our spiritual life. Work with those and accelerate and focus on the positive. Chanting, dancing, uh, reading Prabhupada's books, preaching Krishna consciousness. Jai Sri Sri Panchatattva Ki Jai. And so there are so many opportunities to make spiritual advancement. But Rupa Goswami says we have to be determined. We have to be determined like that. Because Maya is always there to, not only to discourage us, but to convince us it's not worth it. <laughs> That's the worst form of Maya. When she tries to convince you that the efforts you make in spiritual life are really not necessary. Just take it easy. You know, it's not, you, you know, you're not going to be a pure devotee in this life, so don't try so hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just go with the flow, you know, chant once in a while, read a few books, be nice. She knows she can't tell you, don't be a devotee. She won't do that because she knows it doesn't work. She just gradually uses a little, you know, uh, persuasion, just kind of make you relax and take it easy, you know. You know, I haven't been to a, a movie in a long time, you know, and this is one of my favorites, so yeah, I take a break. Go to the beach. <laughs> I remember when I first joined the Hare Krishna movement, we, they would tell us one of the, the most dangerous time of the year is summer. It's the time for enjoyment. Be careful. <laughs> Be careful of the summertime. The wintertime, you know, you can, you're restricted and you know it's difficult. <laughs> summertime is, oh yes, now I can spread my wings. <laughs> Please last forever. <laughs> and we, there was one devotee who used to come to, to New Vrindavan. And uh, he would come in the summertime, and then when the winter, he'd go away, and then come back the next summer. So we gave him a name, Summerishwara, we called him. <laughs> His name was Sureshwara, so we called him Summerishwara. <laughs> so, yeah, so you have to be careful of the warm weather. It's a time for relaxing, taking it easy, and just sitting out on the cafe and talking for six hours and not doing anything. Wasting time. Time is so precious. It's valuable. You can't buy it back. Bhakti Siddhanta says, money, you can get it, you can lose it, and you can get it again. Time goes in one direction. Time moves and never, and never comes back. So time is very precious. So use your time in the best possible way, and then you'll find that every time you use your time in the best possible way, you find the activities you're doing are always good, they're always nice. The mind will say, oh, what do I do now? Hmm. Uh, and then Krishna will say, chant Hare Krishna. I did my 16 rounds, so what? Do more. <laughs> you can always chant if there's maybe nothing to do or apparently you have some free time like that. 
So Prabhupada said, do you have free time? Find another devotee, sit down, have some bhajans. <laughs> and then you're in Krishna conscious. So using time in the best possible mean, way may means to understand my, whatever time I have is important, it's precious, it's limited. Youth is a folly because youth teaches us, oh, I got so much time. <laughs> when you get old, you think, hmm, when is that day coming? <laughs> when it's all over. <laughs> so, yeah, be, be careful of uh, warm weather and, and young age because these are the two things that are taught to us by material energy as a time to enjoy when you're young and when you have, you know, the nice, warm summer weather. So, uh, it doesn't mean you don't do things. We, we sometimes we go swimming, sometimes we do other things, but um, do everything in relationship to what's best for your Krishna consciousness. And that's the most important thing. And then you'll always be happy. Because when you're Krishna conscious, you're happy. That's the only platform of happiness. Uh, to have a nice material situation means sooner or later, usually sooner, that material situation is going to change. Because nothing stays in this world. Everything is always moving, moving, moving. And it's not always getting better either. <laughs> so don't trust any situation. Always try to be Krishna conscious in whatever situation you're in. Yeah. So one of the ways is here is become satisfied with whatever Krishna give, gives you or whatever Krishna has made you and simply work from there to practice your Krishna consciousness. Don't think there's, I have to be something else, I have to do something else, I have to gain something. In the three modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance, there's three things. A person in the mode of ignorance thinks, if I can get something, I can do something. And if I can do something, I can be something. Mode of ignorance. Getting, doing, being. In the mode of passion, a person thinks, if I can do something, then I can get something, then I can be something. So, get uh, doing first, and then getting. A person in the mode of goodness thinks, if I can be something, then I can do something, and I can get something. So it's about character. And from, from goodness we go to transcendence, just be Krishna conscious, and everything else will follow automatically. Okay, so any questions, comments? Um, yes. Uh, I kind of uh, have also uh, situations when, uh, let's say, like today, you have some free, more free time, and then uh, think like, oh, should I chant more or something? But then I think like, you know, you never read, so you, maybe you should read first. That's fine. You know, so is it like, can we just like make like a list? Do something that will further your Krishna consciousness, and so. In other words, don't waste time. Reading, chanting, doing some service, assisting another devotee in service. These are all things you could use. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, first, thank you for your time and uh, sharing your time with us. And uh, I have uh, one question. Uh, like uh, uh, before we were talking about the wife and uh, husband and uh, yeah. marriage uh, uh, and I wanted to ask uh, uh, were you serious with this if uh, a woman uh, wants to stab you with the knife? Which no, no, that's just a joke. That's just a joke. No, no. no that was just a joke. No, they just, just find the tape and cut that part out. Yeah. <laughs> That was just a joke. 
There was no truth to that joke either, don't worry. Why, is that your situation? <laughs> I was in that situation, so I can't... Get, get out of it, yeah. It's better for both of you if you don't. <laughs> no, it's, I was just making some puns on rhymes, that's all. <laughs> yeah, any other questions? None of the ladies have questions? Yes, Mr. Roberto. It's easier to remember when I write down. Uh, uh, three things that we should be satisfied is money that comes by our own accord, uh, over endeavoring to get more money. So it doesn't include the, the when we have some talents and we are actually developing these talents. And the thing is, the, pra the scriptures say live according to your needs, and that way you'll have enough time for practicing Krishna consciousness. If you have a house and you have a wife, you're a householder, there's certain needs. If you're single, there's lesser needs. But if you go according to the standard uh, worldly st you know, statements of what you need, you'll be buying everything, you know. I need this, I have that. Just like, you know, I had a... So I've had my computer for the last six years, the last one I had. So I thought, all right, I should get another one. But then the person said, why? It works. I said, yeah, okay, you're right. <laughs> so it's still working. I, I didn't get in. So the idea is, you know, we're always thinking to change, make it better, get a better car, get a better computer, get a better this, better, better that, get a better that. Learn how to live within your needs. Those who live simply are more happier than those who try to, you know, collect a lot of material things in order to fulfill. Because material things really just fulfill this need of loneliness. That's all it is. If you have relationships with other devotees, then that's the fulfillment you need. All these other things are not so important. That's why the most important thing in life is relationships. Develop relationships with Krishna, develop relationships with devotees, and based on those relationships, you're happy. And then you don't start thinking about so many, all these other needs that are coming up. They keep selling products based on people's dissatisfaction with life. Because you're dissatisfied, therefore you need this to be happy. And therefore they're making more money, just simply by, you know, trying to tempt you to get more, to have more, to do more like that. Okay, so it's based on how much more time you, you spend for work and what kind of things you're spending on. Yeah, you live, the idea is, the, it's one of here, just one of the, the austerities of the mind is simplicity. And the Sri Yashupanishad says, Ishavasam idam sarvam that everything animate and inanimate is owned and controlled by the Lord, and one should live according to their quota. If one lives according to their quota, then they can aspire for, to live for hundreds of years. People don't live according to their quota, they just try to get more and more and more, because that, that's the lack of fulfillment of the heart. When the heart is satisfied, then you, know, then, then you don't need all these things. But just is to fill that void of, because everyone, lo, life means two things, to give love and to ex receive love. This is life, to find that, to give love and to receive love. If you want to receive love, you have to give love. If you're waiting to receive love and you're not giving love, good luck. <laughs> if you want to be loved, love. So therefore, if you learn how to love others and love Krishna, then you'll find that your life is fulfilling like that. And then you don't start to worry about so many other things. Because that, that love is all you need. That's all you need. And you may have some other things you need in order to keep your body and soul together. But you don't go around trying to get so many things because you're satisfied in relationships. And the highest principle of life is a loving relationship. And that's the purpose of life, is to find love in life. 
find that love with Krishna, and then you can find it with devotees, and we can find it with everyone, actually. <laughs> so that love means to serve. Love means to serve. Love means to sacrifice for, for a person you're trying to show love to. Whether it's Krishna, your wife, your husband, or someone in general. But that sacrifice becomes pleasing because the result is the, the loving exchange comes like that. When one is always thinking about what they're going to get in a relationship, then it's more like a standoff between two people trying to get something from the other person. And that's why relationships fall apart. <laughs> relationships last when people try to think, how can I serve the other person in such a way as to benefit that person or to make that person happy? Then that is, that is the relationship. So you th you see you learn you learn what that person likes or what that person needs and you try to fulfill that <laughs> and that's that develops a loving relationship <laughs> and that's what keeps relationships strong so when in with Krishna the spiritual master tells us what Krishna wants from us and then we try to fulfill it and we develop our attraction and love for Krishna. So in our day-to-day -day life with devotees, devotee, if you want to serve and have a relationship with devotees, do something with devotees. Give, a, give them prasadam, give them a gift, tell them about Krishna, assist them in their service, uh, talk about Krishna, work together to pr practice Krishna consciousness. All these things are natural to happiness in this in Krishna consciousness or just basic happiness in the world like that. But there's different types of personalities. So some persons are very more able to do that easily and others are more have to make an effort. You know, just like giving people knowledge is a way to benefit a person. So you may not be so personally in a loving relationship, but if you can give people knowledge when they can use that knowledge to benefit, that's showing love to that person. It's done as a, as a, a service to the person and not simply as an expression of one's ego. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I'm just, I know I'm just talking to fit if it doesn't make sense just say hey Maharaj you know wait a minute <laughs> yeah let me know if I'm not saying the right thing because I need, sometimes I need to be corrected any other questions or points yes Mm. Because um, sometimes I do distinguish, but uh, most of the time I guess I'm not. Well, where is it coming from, this laziness? Apparently, it's laziness. A lack of enthusiasm for activity? No, no. <laughs> I don't have a lack of enthusiasm, but um, um, lack of um, um, body strength. Oh, in other words, you're not... Well, you can be enthusiastic for the things you can do. That, that I am. <laughs> well, that's good. Not that, not that you have to be enthusiastic for everything in life. Because some things may not be necessary and other things just may be too difficult. Therefore, if you're showing enthusiasm in those things that bring you closer to Krishna and closer to in your relationships then that's perfect. So we don't have to always be good or enthusiastic at everything. But if it's, there's a requirement, there's two things the way, there's two ways to get things done. Either you do it yourself 
or get someone to help you to do it or let them do it. <laughs> a lot of times if you go to a devotee and can you say, I can't do this, can you help me? The devotee says, sure. The devotees like to help devotees. <laughs> right? I think one of the things that devotees like is when someone asks them to do something for them, right? Immediately you want to do it. This is the nature of a devotee. So sometimes we have to ask someone to help us like that. And that builds relationships. As long as it's not putting that person into, into a difficult situation, then you'd establish some kind of relationship. It has to be done in a respectable way like that. Hey, can you teach me how to do this? Or I'm lazy in this way, not lazy. It's not lazy, it's just a lack of interest, I think, sometimes. We may not be so interested in reading, but we can be interested in hearing. So we can, instead of, if we're not always enthusiastic to pick up the books and read, we should at least hear the lectures. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? Yes, it is late. Okay. So, all right, thank you very much. And tomorrow we'll do some yoga exercises for those who are yogis. Any yogis here? Sabina? Okay, we got one yogi. You'll like this one. Come to class tomorrow. Okay. We're going to switch from, from yeah. We're going to switch from bhakti yoga to preliminary bhakti yoga of some pranayama. <laughs> I'll teach you some pranayama, which will help you in your Krishna consciousness. Oh, before we close for the night, I've been talking about the holy name in the morning and about the mind in the evening, and uh, this is one little book. It's called 20 Affirmations Based on Improving the Quality of Your Japa, written by one, my godbrother Mahatma Prabhu, who runs Japa workshops all the time. And based on his experiences, he's come up with these 20 statements. An affirmation is a statement of positive doing. It's like a sankalpa. I will do this. So he's made these affirmations based on his workshops, which give us a certain mindset that we can carry into our japa, which will improve the quality of our japa. So the book is free, but if you'd like to give a donation, we don't have a problem with that. But the book is free. Anyone who didn't get one this morning, uh, you can come up and get one tonight, and here they are. And read one. I read one. I, I was reading him every day. One, he, I, just, I just opened one random. I fully honor my sacred relationship with the holy name during Japa. That's one of them. I treat the Maha Mantra as Radha and Krishna fully present and sound. It's all positive statements that help develop a certain mindset. So if you're interested, come on up and I'll give you a book. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Anyone on, on that side didn't get one? Okay. okay.
Thanks for, thanks for playing.